Hi, I'm Jeff Sikinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, coming to you from Peter Schramm's library in Ashland, Ohio. I want to welcome everybody to this episode of The American Idea. I'm Jeff Sikinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center and, of course, host for this conversation today. Today we're going to be talking about one of the defining moments in American history, in the meaning of this country and our understanding of the American idea, and that is the Constitutional Convention of 1787 that gave birth to the document that still governs us to this day, the United States Constitution. To talk about that really epochal moment in American history and world history are two old friends of the Ashbrook Center. First, Gordon Lloyd. Gordon is Doxon Emeritus Professor of Public Policy at Pepperdine University and a senior fellow here at Ashbrook. He earned his MA and PhD in government from Claremont Graduate School He is an immigrant to the United States from the West Indies, from Trinidad and Tobago, and has an immigrant's love for this country and a deep desire to not only understand this country, but share that understanding with his fellow Americans. And he's done that in lots of ways, one of which has been teaching for many, many years in Pepperdine's wonderful School of Public Policy program. Also teaching for Ashbrook in our Teaching American History seminars and our Master of Arts in American History and Government, and of course by publishing widely on America, American history, and the American founding. He's written books and articles on the founding, on political economy, and public policy. He currently serves on the National Advisory Council for the Walter and Lenore Annenberg Presidential Learning Center through the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. Gordon is without question one of the leading experts on the Constitutional Convention. He spent many decades studying this, thinking deeply about the the Convention and what it means not only for the United States Constitution, but more broadly for America. Gordon, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Our, Our other guest today is another old friend, as I said before, of Ashbrook, Professor Chris Burkett. As many of our listeners know, Chris is a professor of political science at Ashland University. He's the director of the Ashbrook Scholar Program and a faculty member on Ashbrook's Master of Arts in American History and Government Program. He earned his BA in, uh, from Ashland University. Chris, I think in history and art. Fine art. No. Fine art, in fact. <laughs> Fantastic. So he is a Renaissance man. <laughs> and his MA and PhD in political science from the University of Dallas. He, he returned to Ashland in 2005 and has been teaching undergraduate and graduate classes for us in American politics and in the U.S. Constitution, and in particular in the American founding. And in fact received in 2011 the highest award the university confers on teaching, which is the Taylor Excellence in Teaching Award. He's also Uh, like Gordon, a published author, and in particular uh, of note, he is the editor of Ashbrook's 50 Core American Documents volume, which is a terrific collection for students, teachers, and citizens. Chris, so thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here with both of you today. Let me get us started, if I can, in this question about the um, Constitutional Convention. Gordon, you have written about this, both for Ashbrook and more broadly in the public, about thinking about the Constitutional Convention as a drama, a a story, a four-act drama, in fact, is the way you put it. Why do you think it's appropriate for us to think about the Constitutional Convention, which we think of as a kind of, a lot of folks would just understand as a kind of a bunch of boring, dusty, old, dry speeches from some guys in Philadelphia a long time ago. Why should we think about it as a drama? Uh, Well, good question. One of the, I think, obstacles to trying to grasp the conversation that led to the Constitution, one of the difficulties is the immensity of the material. Madison's debates, just his own notes, uh, exceed 300 and so pages. Mm -hmm. And it's it's sort of um, overwhelming. All these pages, all these notes, how do you break it down? How do you understand it? And 
I think there are certain turning points in the conversation. And what I wanted to do with the four-act drama was to try to capture those turning points. And therefore, one could take a breath hmm. and have uh, like a little intermission or something. And then the more I looked at that, in fact, I remember several years ago, you were doing a, a lecture at, the, at Pepperdine, and you were driving me back to my condo, and you asked me, um, what, why did you come across this idea? Right. Oh, I, um, I remember that now that you asked me. So uh, it's, it's the Virginia plan. We all know, so, so in a certain sense, the whole thing, in a way, begins with the Virginia plan. And then there's a reaction to the Virginia plan. And it seems that there's a certain closure hmm. with... <laughs> Uh, a compromise or a solution that takes place in Act in, in, in what I've called Act One. Right. So we leave, we begin Act One with say, the Virginia Plan. We end Act One with a, an amended Virginia Plan, with the introduction of the New Jersey Plan, but the rejection of the New Jersey Plan, but some amended. Right. right. So that ends. So, so, uh, so it just yeah. strikes you then yeah, it, as it is almost like a play in the sense that there's conversation, there's dialogue on it. an issue, and then it sort of comes to a conclusion and they move on to something else. So there's a natural break in the dramatic action. Correct. It's not me so much imposing my will on the material as much as me trying to help the reader understand Mm. What is right. going on? The natural flow of the convention itself. Exactly. Chris, let me just take us back before we even start. Sometimes plays have prologues. Right. For our listeners, take us back to the convention itself before Act One even begins. When is the Constitutional Convention? Where is the Constitutional Convention? Who's there? at the Constitutional Convention. How does it come to be that we get up to the point of Act One? And then I want to dive right in to Act One. Yeah, good. I, again, that's great. And again, if I can just say quickly on, on the, the four-act drama, the other reason that this is actually really helpful is it's, a, it's, it's dramatic. Ah. <laughs> so we'll, but maybe we'll get into that more when we get into the particular acts as we go through them. But um, I think you could say that the story of the convention starts well before 1776. but like there's a kind of natural starting point with the Declaration of Independence. So when the uh, uh, Americans um, declare independence, they still have a lot of work to do. Um, it's the beginning of their work, right? It's the, it really is the beginning of their work. And what, what's the work? Upon declaring independence, they have an unprecedented opportunity and an unprecedented challenge, unprecedented challenge to frame governments mm. that agree with the ideas of the Declaration that are compatible with the American mind, as Thomas Jefferson called it, um, and that actually secure and promote the ideas that are laid out in the, in the Declaration of Independence. So between 1777, 76, um, into 77 with the first attempt at a government for the Union in the Articles of Confederation, through 1787 at the convention, Americans are working out in practice, what it means to have good, let's call it Republican, mm -hmm. lowercase r, generally speaking, lowercase r, Republican government, that, that, that agrees with the principles and the ideas of the revolution and the declaration. So we have the revolution beginning, giving us, articulating this American mind, and then the Americans, as you put it, try to put those principles into practice right. first in their states, right? This, in forming state absolutely. constitutions and state governments. Yeah, the state, a lot of, there's a lot of, um, you can almost call it experimentation, that's not, maybe not quite the right word, but they're trying different things. Some of, some of the states have some things in common in terms of what their governments are like, but they're trying to figure out, because nobody's ever done this before. When has a right. people in history get, first of all, had the opportunity to declare their independence from another country and, and, and defend it? But then start fresh in a way, right? From mm -hmm. from scratch and, and framing government. So on the state level, what we know is there's got to be consent, and these governments ought to somehow protect right and uh, rights, and it's got to be it's got to be done by majority rule. So what should our uh, you know what should the powers of the legislatures be? What should the relationship between executive 
uh, powers and legislative and judicial right. powers be? Do we need declarations of rights? <laughs> you in, know, these in, our, in the state constitution the themselves, state all of these are arguments. And, we, and, and also, we're going to write them down. So yeah, what we it's have a written robust, constitution. Yeah. So what we have is, is, is Chris, a robust four-year development of republicanism at the state and local level. Mm -hmm. Right. So that lays, that's kind of the prologue, as you say, for the Constitutional Convention. Right. We're all familiar, of course, then with there is varied levels of success in the states. So some states, you might say, Pennsylvania or Virginia or New York are quite successful in their state governments, I'll just assert for now. And then some states like Rhode Island have continuous trouble in trying to come up with something. Um, but you have this experiment in republicanism, in self-government. Uh, at the federal level, I think a lot of our listeners are familiar with the fact that the Articles of Confederation are created and adopted and put into practice in the 1780s. Generally speaking, people like Madison regard them increasingly, it seems like, as a failure, a failure to secure the American Union in a Republican form of government. Yeah. So then we, right. it, the failures in, in this respect lead us up to the Constitutional Convention itself. Remind our li li listeners, Chris, when does the Constitutional Convention take place, where does it take place, and who's attending? It takes place in Philadelphia, and it's supposed to start in May of 1787, mm -hmm. with with the you know with, with Congress calling for this this grand convention of the states, and um, it is going to be attended by delegates from each state, each of the 13 states, or at least that's the plan. Uh, I think they're selected, Gordon. They're selected by the state legislatures, are they not? E e yes, in and, most of the states. And to and to reinforce your point, there the, the delegates there um, sort of arrive with, if not instructions, commissions, so the commissions yeah, and uh, sort of outlines. And there are two, there's two. One was the, um, uh, what Congress itself did. Why you're here. The, so Congress, in its in call for a convention, says the, the purpose is for delegates to create a federal <laughs> government <laughs> uh, improve, adequate to the in, national improve emergencies. Improve and report back. Right. Okay. Exactly. And then there's the other one, right. which is the Annapolis Convention, which is really Madisonian, Washington, Hamilton driven, outside of the existing government, calling for a convention to be held. So seven, seven state legislatures respond to that call, independently of what Congress wants. Okay. Congress then comes along later on and says, we give you authorization to do this under the following guidelines that you amend to make us work and you report back to us. So okay. six states follow that instruction and seven states follow, oh, the, the other six in Rhode Island doesn't, as you quite frankly pointed out, doesn't know what it's doing. They, yeah, they, they never show up. So, 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 so we've got. A, so at the beginning, we've got um, two different kinds of reasons for being there. Mm -hmm. One is the structure doesn't work. That's the Annapolis folks. Mm -hmm. The structure is fine. All we need is to amend powers of the Confederation, because the Confederation were, were um, expressly limited to what was stated, mm -hmm. and two powers were not stated. One, taxation, and two, control over interstate commerce. Right. So go, and if you take care of those two things and come back, that will be fine. So part of the drama of the, of the setting and the play, so to speak, of the event is, of the convention is, You've got delegates from states, different delegates from different states showing up with different ideas of what the purpose of this convention is in the first place. From the very beginning. And, and but it, it takes two days, maybe a, maybe a day and a half at the convention for those two views to start clashing. Uh -huh. so there are delegates on the second day saying, oh, after the Virginia plan's introduced, there are delegates saying, wait a minute, we're not authorized to even be talking about stuff like that, at least according to what our commission or whatever you want to call it, yeah. we're supposed to be doing. I mean, so. and the people who came so. here because of Annapolis, yeah. uh, relying completely on the declaration which says you have the right to choose the form of government on which you shall live, right. say, oh yeah, we do. Here's what we're suggesting. <laughs> we're suggesting the Virginia plan. Yeah. And guess what? It's not, 
there's no role for the states in the Virginia plan at all. Hmm. Yeah. So we, we, we get this arrival of delegates. How many delegates do we know are there the first day of the convention of what, May 29th, 1787? That, that's when the official business that's begins. When the official I think that's when they finally get Delegates start sort of trickling in that's before right. that. But, but you, need, you, need, you need seven out of 13 in order to, to have a quorum in order that's, to start. Can I, can I say on that point, seven out of 13 states, this is another complication. Um, it's, it's not just like up to 55 individual people there, but th this is all to be done, it's done by states. By states. Right. So that, that's another complication of things. You've got individuals speaking, and they have their own views on what needs to be done or shouldn't be done. But the voting is done all by, by blocks of state delegates. Okay. That then, complicates things even yeah, further. To rate, even so. further complicate yeah. it as the drama, <laughs> within each state, each state has a quorum requirement. So each state has to have a certain number of people, people there from their state, state delegates. In order for the state to be represented and speak. Okay. So you have so, to have so many states there before you can do business, right. and then you have to have so many delegates in your state, from your state, to actually vote. All right. So it's a complicated start oh, even a mess. If, to get it going. <laughs> it looks right. like it could end up being a mess. The first day, do we call it, of the official convention, Act 1, yes. begins on May 29th? That's correct. Take us to Act 1. The, what you have called the alternative plans, Gordon. Act 1 from May 29th, 1787 to That's June 19th, 1787. What is the central <laughs> drama of this first act of the Constitutional Convention? The Virginia plan says we've got a structural problem. So we've got to, we've got to solve and, and the structural problem is the role of the states and the Articles of Convention are so, Articles of Confederation are so weak that they cannot interfere with what's going on at the state level. So we need a structural change. We want republicanism at the national level, which we don't have under the Articles of Confederation. You have one state, one vote. People aren't represented. The states are represented. So the Virginia plan really attempts to to achieve republicanism at the national level, something that has never been done before. Okay, and it's called the Virginia Plan because it's offered by delegates from, from the state Virginia, of Virginia. That's primarily who? Um, written by Madison and offered by the governor Randolph. Edmund Randolph? Uh, um, no, not um, um, yeah, 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 Edmund Randolph. James Madison. James Madison That's writes right. it, but Randolph is yeah. governor, so he has a place of he, honor. He has a in place of honor. I see. Edmund Randolph. So James Madison writes this plan, yes. and as you say, it's really a plan for the first time ever to have a national, a, 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 what we would understand to be a real government. That's correct. And so what Madison introduces for the first time is that. You have bicameralism, because under the Articles there's only one chamber. So now republicanism, you have two chambers. And Madison did not, and did not envision in the second chamber that the states would be represented. Hmm. It would be the people would be represented in a different way in the second chamber okay. as a way of restraining what might happen in the House. Okay. It's not old-fashioned bicameralism the House of Commons, the House of Lords, and very interestingly, he doesn't call it the lower branch and the upper branch, they call it the first branch and the second branch. Right. Very Republican, mm -hmm. see? Yeah. Right. And so one has to sit back and wonder, why you want two branches, <laughs> right? We, we're not, where do the states fit it? So then there's a proposal to have an executive. Under the Articles, there was no independent executive. There was no president. There was no president, right. And so they, was in, and they introduced tentatively the idea of a judiciary. Only Massachusetts really had the state level. So this is playing around with something rather new. So Madison's proposal introduces a national legislature. Yes. With direct powers of things like taxation. But not only that, let me, let, let, you're right on the right track. It is that Congress has the power to do anything that the states are incompetent to do. Wow. And that Congress is the one who decides. And Congress also has power to veto state legislation, which is contrary to the intention of this entire enterprise. That is a national government. That's, that's <laughs> a, it's a, a national, really government national government with yeah. now its own executive branch to Correct. enforce its laws Correct. and its own judicial branch to interpret and decide cases according to those laws. Yeah. Right. To be fleshed out. A true national government. What's the response 
of what the delegates. Whoa! <laughs> what are you talking about? And Roger, and, yeah, so I said, well, what is going on here? And Roger Sherman, was a late arrival. From Connecticut. From Connecticut, and he arrives and he says, um, this has never been done before. The people are happier in small republics. That's the June 6th. And that's his challenge to Madison. Uh, and people in the audience, the delegates said, yeah, where you, that's what republicanism means. It means homogeneous, uh, 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 virtue, smallness, etc. Looking at republics of the ancient past, yeah. like ancient Rome or yeah, ancient yeah, Greece. Or, or, yeah, and adopted through Montesquieu, and adopted. The French through, political thinker, yes. That's correct. And then, and so I'm, I'm applied to the American experience, which has been very much alive from 1776 at the state and local level. All right. So how does Sherman and the folks who are, 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 are taken aback by the Virginia plan, how do they push back? They push back by saying that and force Madison to defend it. Mm. And Madison's defense is um, <laughs> only a large republic will be able to deal with the problem of faction. Uh -huh. This is the famous Federalist 10 later, uh, an outline form on June the 6th, which he, Madison has already outlined earlier as to why the articles don't work. So Madison says we need a large commercial republic to control the rival and opposite interests. Okay, so Madison says, look, in a, in a republic you're, where people are free, you're naturally going to have conflict. Yes. The question is, you can't, get, you can't get away from conflict. The question is, how do you control that conflict and make it work for a republic and not destroy a republic? Yes. And right. he says, you have to have a large republic. And Sherman says, no, you need a small republic where everybody is friends and gets along. See, Chris, see what, what see is, what's the, Sherman's see, see what, argument and what's his counterproposal? Yeah, what's, what's going on here at the same time as what Gordon's been talking about? And this is, there are a lot of things sort of interwoven with each other, right? So there's the whole national government versus federal, right, where the states are important. When Sherman says the people are happier in small republics, that I think what Sherman is saying here is small, the states are the primary protectors of, of rights and liberties. This is where people's happiness uh, is most directly affected by their mm -hmm. government. But, um, but as we were saying earlier, this, you know, the, in this period where the state government, people are uh, creating state governments, one thing Madison notices is those state governments are not doing a very good job of securing rights. So, ah. so they're violating their own, their own declarations of rights in so many cases. So, what's, so there's this whole, there's the, there are the delegates of the convention who are, are, are um, arguing about what the best kind of representation is. I think that's the, the, the core yeah, well, of the first he, he, two acts in a way. Yeah, yeah. Is it, what's the best? Is it federal representation? That is sort of representation of the states. The states still matter. They're really important. They've got an important role to play in securing rights. Or is it sort of national representation? That is where individuals are represented. And Madison, what Madison's interested in is finding the, and Sherman, by the way, is finding the best kind of representation that will actually do a better job of securing the rights and the liberties okay. and the happiness of so, citizens. So Sherman, on June the 11th, says, let's make a deal. All right. <laughs> What deal does he want to make? He says, Madison, I'll give you a popular representation in the first branch if I can have uh, equal representation for the states in the second branch. And Madison sort of mutters, and, and the <laughs> South Carolina delegation says, now wait a minute, we're talking about people representation, we're talking about states representation. Representation through the history of the world has often been based on wealth. Okay. So, so what about representing wealth? And South Carolina's interest, particularly interest in wealth, is uh, representation with slavery. Uh -huh. So it's that day, June the 11th, that the, that the Madison-Sherman debate becomes altered by Madison, Sherman, uh, say Pinckney, Rut Rutledge, Butler debate. So this is really June 11th. Yes. Is the first time that slavery, directly or indirectly at least, is injected into the debate, into correct. the drama. That is correct. 
All right. What we have a New Jersey, we have the Virginia plan. Yes. We have this rival New Jersey plan, which is also put forward in Act One here. Chris, the New Jersey plan, what's that? Yeah, that's the response in writing, if you will, in terms of an alternative plan from from Sherman and Ellsworth of Connecticut and Patterson and Brearley of New Jersey. This is why it's called the New Jersey plan. I think it's Patterson and Brearley who submit it, right, or, or draft it. And, and the purpose of this is to say, we don't need to go tinkering around with all this structure stuff, and we don't need to stop being federal and becoming national. What we need are uh, our sufficient powers in the hands of this Congress that we have under the Articles of Confederation mm. to fix whatever problems we've been dealing with. So there's an interest, and in, you know, there's a real value in reading Madison's debates, and especially the edition that Gordon and has done with Ashley. And let me recommend that to our listeners very highly. It's it is really a, an authoritative edition of Madison's notes that really allows the full story of the convention to be heard. It really is, and it's the, I think it's the way Madison would have wanted them to be published. But Ma, but Gordon's uh, and the Ashbrook edition has included these interesting footnotes that Madison had written in his debates at the moment. And there's a footnote when the Patterson or New Jersey plan is introduced. There's a footnote of a conversation between between James Dickens. Madison and, and John, John Dickinson, Dickinson. Right. who was inclined to want to go along with Madison somewhat. But, there, but Madison records this side conversation, and Dickinson goes to Madison and says, see what you've done? You've pushed it too far. <laughs> and now we've, got a, now we've got to deal with an alternative plan that's on the table. Because Madison rejected Sherman. He said, no, nope, none, he, none of this partly stuff. Sherman. That's right. He rejected yeah. Sherman. And what passed as the amended Virginia plan was the three-fifths clause was included. Right. That's why the South and Carolina... And that's why you had the New Jersey was... plan introduced. All right. So, so the at the end of Act 1 of yes. the drama, we have these two competing plans. Um, we have the Virginia plan. We have the New Jersey plan. We're already into mid-June here. We've got all of these complications of large states and small states. What should the basis of representation be? What about the issue of slavery? All of these unresolved dramatic tensions, problems. Gordon, you've argued that Act Two begins on June 20th. What happens to begin the second act of the Constitutional Convention drama? We've got these two competing plans. Well, the question is, which way are we going to go? All right. Uh, let me amend your two plans by saying there's an amended Virginia plan ah. which includes the three-fifths clause. Okay. And that's what passes. And it passes extremely narrowly. Okay. Who's not going for it? Sherman. Roger Sherman. Of uh -huh. Right? And that, so as we enter Act 2 on June the 20th, what is on the table is the amended Virginia plan. Madison's okay. plan with the three-fifths clause. All right. Can I just say, just for clarity, the reason that's important is because the reason they're working with the amended Virginia plan is because South Carolina and Georgia are on board with it, but only because of the three-fifths clause. And just to remind our listeners, Chris, the three-fifths clause is what? Uh, for purposes of representation um, in a state, uh, from a state, all persons are counted and three-fifths, all free persons are counted, and then three-fifths of all other persons. Okay, so, so this is a way number for... Of, what do you base the number of representatives and on? And this is a way state? for slave states like South Carolina to have what they think is increased representation. More representation. Because so, their slaves, although they don't count, see them as human beings, they are counted as human beings for the or citizens for the purposes of representation. You got it. And that gets South Carolina on board with the amended Virginia. That's right. And that's, okay. where, that, that's how wealth gets into the picture. And Sherman responds with his buddies, which is often called the small states plan, but we are going to call it, say, like the um, New Jersey plan, which is not simply small states. It's, 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 it's interested in the role of the states, whether large or small. Okay. Right? So, and, and, and what they're not willing to go along with is this compromise which ends Act 1, which is the amended plan. Right. And so what they propose, the New Jersey plan, which says we're going to go straight back to the beginning. We're only going to go, we're only going to present what Congress authorized us to do, which is we're going to increase, give, increase taxation, right? Give Congress the power to tax. And, what are, and how are they going to be able to tax? They're going to be able to tax in accordance with Three fifths. That's where the three. So Sherman includes the three fifths, but not as representation of slaves, but in terms of raising revenue on wealth. 
they have a tax on wealth. Okay. Right? And an increase in power to tax, power to regulate interstate commerce, and no alteration in the structure whatsoever. So Sherman says, we stop. We start all over so again. So wait a minute. Now, what you're telling me is they've passed a plan. Yes. The Virginia plan with the three-fifths clause in it. That's it, right. But narrowly, but yes. it looks like, phew, finally we got that issue exactly. settled. Exactly. And then the whole thing is thrown into turmoil yes. by people saying, we don't accept this. Let's go back to the very beginning and start again. What is the reaction of people like James Madison or Alexander Hamilton who thought at least we've made some progress? Now it looks like all that progress has been thrown out the window. Chris, what's the reaction? Yeah. Well, can I say the, 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 the second act is, is, kind of, is a stalemate. And it's the it's the Sherman and the and the Pattersons and those types who, uh, of delegates. They're just they're not going to give in to the amended Virginia plan. So for about two weeks, what you have is v there are votes. But I think at this point, if I'm not mistaken, Gordon, and remember, delegates vote by state blocks. Right. There are f ten states there. Am I right about mm -hmm. this? During all of this, which means that often there's a five state five state oh. vote. On these things, okay, and and what does it take for the Virginia amended Virginia plan to be actually passed? Six four, right? Am I wrong about this? Yeah, no, no. Well, actually, the Virginia. Well, I mean, we're talking about the amended Virginia plan. Yeah, well, right. the amended Virginia plan is supposedly on the table, right? But, it, but Sherman has stopped it from being on the table, from as you said. So, so we now reach the end of June. Either right. two weeks, right? Yeah. We at the end of June. How are we going to break this stalemate? The tie. And so, what often happens is we create a committee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So we create a committee, and the committee is going to be a one representative from each state, and um, this committee is called the Jerry Committee. After Elbridge Jerry, one of the representatives from Massachusetts. From which we get the word gerrymander. D d that's correct. Because at that time, uh, 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 when the gerrymander name came, he was governor of All right, that's, Massachusetts. So that's later. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So anyway, so, they, so Elbridge Jerry, uh, who signed the Declaration of Independence. Yes. And uh, was prominent and given this role. And um, so each state had the opportunity to have one member on. And as far as I can tell, it was up to all the delegates present to choose one member from each state. Each state didn't choose their own member. Really? That's interesting. See, okay. I, I, I can't be 100% on that, but the sense that I have of the dynamics of the convention and the drama that goes on is that it was the sense of the convention Hmm. that we have these committees, and on those committees, we were going to have people who were going to work this out. Because, I'm sorry. Go I'm ahead. Because no, 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 the reason this is important is, uh, uh, tell them who was not on the committee from Virginia. Ma uh, Madison. Whoa. <laughs> the very guy who brought the convention, yeah. tried to get the convention yeah. started, so say, introduced the first plan. No, That's okay. right. He's not on it. Randolph is. Mason. Mason. Sorry, George That's Mason. Right. Mason. That's right. It's our later committee. Mason. Mason is a person who you can deal with. George Mason. George Mason is a person who you can deal with. So he is chosen. He obviously would not be chosen by the Virginia delegation itself. Right. That's why I think it's, a, it's, a, it's the sense or mood of the convention that in accordance with the various rules that each state has to be represented, that who from that group are going to be, is going to be chosen? Mason. Is All right. Chosen. He's more open to compromise potential. Yeah, he's more open to compromise. And he Mason is really, the, uh, he really is the deal maker on, on, the, on the Connecticut Compromise, which ends Act Two, which is the work of the Jerry Committee. And what is the Connecticut Compromise? It, when it comes from Sherman. Of course, of right, Connecticut. Of course, right. And, and the Connecticut Compromise then is, or the Jerry Committee Compromise is, popular representation in the House with three fifths, and one state, one vote in the Senate, and Sherman is worried and said, this is what I proposed be before without, <laughs> without even having the three-fifths clause so in there. Three weeks ago, he said. Three weeks he's ago, and yet, you know, now we have, and Mason still has to be convinced. And so Mason says, here's the, um, here's, here's, the, here's what joins, here's the glue. 
money bills can only be introduced in the House and cannot be amended in the Senate. That is no taxation without representation. So Mason, mm. Mason is still based on the popular plan, but he will go along with Sherman's one state, one vote. As long as you give him this no taxation without representation, and that, that is manifested itself in the money bills provision. Okay, so here we even, here's a great <laughs> particular example of folks, if listeners would want to know, how did the Constitutional Convention and the Constitution try to follow the principles of the Declaration of Independence and of the Revolution? Here's a great example of that. One of the great leading principles of the Revolution is, as you said, Gordon, no taxation without representation, and therefore in government, what does that mean? It means that the the l branch of the legislature that's based on the people who give their consent has to be the one that originates and passes money bills. That's it's correct. Taking their property because one state, one vote, one state, one vote in the Senate is not popular representation. All right. What is the what happens to the Connecticut Compromise? It gets passed six five one. Six five one. To, to that close. Debated for two weeks. Yeah. To be debated for two weeks. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And Massachusetts is divided. And the reason it's divided is because Jerry, being on the, the Jerry committee, decides to go along with their own compromise, which the committee has done. And, they, and, and he, br he brings around Caleb Strong, whose all votes was Jerry, and the other two, King and Gorham, which are high tone, more Madisonian. So they split. So Massachusetts splits. So what has happened is that Massachusetts has moved from supporting the Virginia, an amended Virginia plan, to now supporting this compromise. Now that's the split. Now let me ask you this. The compromise, how does it strike James Madison? How does it strike people like Alexander Hamilton, who wanted a strong, national, go, go popular it. government? This. Chris, go what do they it. think about this compromise? This is such a great... Um, Madison, by the way, who was well respected and known as a as a very good politician and a reasonable fellow, was absolutely unwilling to compromise on the compromise. <laughs> so the compromise <laughs> is introduced on July fifth, and they don't vote on it until July sixteenth. And during the, the the two week period, Madison is pushing and pushing and pushing against it. He doesn't like it at all, um, and he won't bend on it. Uh, but it passes anyway. Now. Um, uh, later, I think Madison will, will come to terms with it and, and try to make lemonade out of lemons, if you will. You'll mm -hmm. see some good things that will come out of it. But with Hamilton, I believe, I think Hamilton's gone by this point. But within so. this time, that's right. Hamilton gets fed up with it. He leaves. So Hamilton, yeah. of course, Don't for our listeners, is a delegate from the state of New York. That's correct. And he leaves the convention in Philadelphia and goes back to New oh, York? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. And he, in effect, says, when you folks stop playing in the sandbox, give me a call. He's bored. Huh. <laughs> He's totally bored by this. And Yates and Lansing together. The other two delegates from New York. There were three delegates from New York. That's Yates, right. Lansing, and, and Hamilton. That's, and they, that's right. And Yates and Lansing would outvote Hamilton all the time. So Hamilton just says, I'm fed up with this. I'm leaving. Yes, right. Yeah, he's bored. He he's writes bored. a letter to Washington. I think yeah. you can read it where he says, when you guys yeah, start yeah, when talking you guys about get important serious, things, yeah. call me. I'll come yeah, back. Because he's not interested <laughs> in this question. Hmm. But because, oh, good. Because how... It, in addition to Virginia plan, amended Virginia plan, New Jersey plan, Hamilton on June the 18th introduces, well, how about my plan? I've been quiet all this long because I've been so young and I've been interested in listening to this conversation. Let me give you my plan. And what is his what's plan? The, yeah, what's the Hamilton plan? The Hamilton plan virtually removes the states, reduces them to districts. Um, Who, yeah, really. Who? Give, give, uh, says the president can serve for life. It doesn't matter. And, oh, you're a monarchist. You're a monarchist. Nonsense. Monarchy is how you get there. You get there because of your mommy and your daddy. Monarchy, monarchy is how you get there. Republicanism is how you get there, by election. So as long as the president, etc., is elected, doesn't matter how long he stays there. And so that is a wow. Hamiltonian introduction of which none of the delegates were willing to do. No, so Hamilton's plan was to abolish the states, essentially. Yes. And elect a president for life. That's correct. And okay. yeah, yeah, that's right. And and yeah, right, yeah, that 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 is correct. And no one was that Hamilton was not really part of the conversation at that time. But all the details he said there were sort of put on a shelf. So when when the when the folks later on have worked through when we get to Act Three, mm -hmm. then 
people have settled those things and now are willing to talk about separation of powers, willing to talk about those kinds of things, about how you elect the president, etc. Uh -huh. And then Hamilton's uh, work, say, might be con might come down and, and now we might be able to, so Hamilton's plan did not have an impact on Act 1 and Act 2. Is it because, Gordon, because when people heard that, they just said, that's crazy. There's no way we're going to do that? And so they reacted violently, angrily against it? Or did they just literally think, that's so crazy, we're just going to ignore it? Well, I think it's crazy um, we're going to ignore it. But, but, but it, it's almost like Hamilton threw a wrench into the conversation. The conversation at that time was between popular representation mm -hmm. or representation of states. Right. And, and Hamilton is bored by that question. OK, so he, he said, look, you guys are focusing on the wrong issues. And they said, no, we're focusing on this issue now. Whatever your plan says, we're just not going to think about that right now because we got to settle this issue. That's and right. he says, well, when you've settled that issue, which I don't think matters, give me a call and I'll come back from New York. I think that's a, re a very reasonable way of looking at it. Yeah. End of Act Two, the Connecticut Compromise has passed. Act Three. Yes, now I have an intermission. Oh, we have an intermission. All right. Lots of plays and movies, especially long ones like this one, have intermissions. <laughs> right. So an, intermi so an intermission on, is now that we have settled the great difficulty of representation, right? Mm -hmm. We now need to get down to business. And to get down to business, we now create, for the first time, we create a committee of five. No longer are they going to work one state, one vote, etc. You create a committee of five. And the first time, I thought, man, man this, is, this, is, this is very interesting. And the, it, the whole role of committees comes out. And they have committee of three, committee of five, committee on seven, not all committee of 13. Is When you want to get something done, rather than to talk about it, you reduce the number of committees, the, the, com on the, committee. Committee, the members of the committee. <laughs> yeah. Right? So the question is, who gets on that committee, which is called the Committee of Detail. Okay. So the intermission is where this committee which is elected at the end of Act Two goes and does its work on over intermission. Everybody goes fishing, does whatever it is, and then well, committee is ready to make its report. I see. So the, basically the convention says, we think we've settled the big issue of, of, of representation, representation by, by the people and the states. Now the power, the particular powers of this government and how they're going to be separated out, we're going to let this committee take and deal with and bring back a report to us. That is correct. All right. So who gets on that committee? Yeah. Who is on yeah. it? Yeah. Well, so one of the things I learned, and it only took, it took some while to learn it, is that you know, you've got to, Virginia has to have a representative on this committee. All right. Um, I don't think we need to argue why. Mm -hmm. Um, Massachusetts, uh, from the whole de declaration, so I mean, if Massachusetts was involved with the revolution, Virginia is now involved with the Constitution. So you've got to have Massachusetts um, and Pennsylvania, which is okay. where it's being held. Right. And those are the three large states. So if you're interested in popular representation, those three states have to be represented. And then if you're, <laughs> Connecticut has to be represented obviously because of such and such. And then you have, so who represents Virginia? Not Madison, it's Randolph. Hmm. Who represents um, uh, 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 Massachusetts? Not King, high tone, uh, but Gorham, who is the speaker of the entire convention, moderate man. Right, Gora. Who represents Pennsylvania? Wilson. Okay. Who represents Connecticut? Roger Sherman, I'm guessing. That is correct. And, 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 and you give Ellsworth a little bit of a run for his money, but he gets sick, so I'll get on it. But, so Connecticut is there. So who is the fifth? And right before the committee is created, Pinckney and Rutledge and uh, the South Carolina delegation say, excuse me, if this committee comes up 
with a recommendation, a resolution on the abolition of slavery, which many members in this room seem to be uh, inclined to do, um, South Carolina will not sign. Bam, that's it. Huh. So South Carolina is, as a matter, South Carolina is throwing it down. What do we do? LBJ, rather than have him in the tent than outside the tent. So South Carolina becomes the fifth. Okay. And Rutledge. And not only that, he becomes the chair of the Committee on Detail. Mm. And then the Committee on Detail makes its report. So the whole of Act Three in during the month of August is going starting at the beginning and working its way all the way through the Committee on Detail report. The Ashbrook Scholar Program is an honors program located at Ashland University for undergraduate students with an interest in politics, history, and economics. Modeled after a classical liberal education, you will read the great texts, not textbooks. Your classes will be conversations, not lectures. Conversations with other students, with your professors, and with great thinkers and statesmen from throughout human history. If you or a young person you know are passionate about life's important questions, if you want an education that emphasizes discovery, if you value liberal education and the principles of freedom it upholds, then this is the place for you. To learn more, visit us online at ashbrookscholar.org. From August 6th, as you say, till August 31st, is Act 3 is the debate, the discussion and debate, and votes on the report of the Committee on Detail. Correct. What are the big issues there, Chris, and what are the votes? Uh, I think they spend the, the bulk of their time talking about <clears throat> what are the specific powers that Congress should have. Okay. That's a, that's a big chunk of what they're doing in this act. Um, but the, but the, you see, the slavery question is now wrapped up in that debate over powers. Mm-hmm. Before it was involved in the issue of representation, right, right, and now it's a matter of what powers Congress can have. South Carolina is afraid, as Gordon said, right. that Congress could have certain powers that might lead it to directly or indirectly limit or even abolish slavery. That's right, yeah. And I don't think it's an accident, by the way, that this happens in Act 3 um, in August. In July, uh, even before the Connecticut Compromise is agreed to, we have another important event that takes place outside of the convention. Hmm. And that is Congress uh, approving the Northwest Ordinance, okay. which prohibits slavery this is in the, the Northwest Territories. This is the existing Congress of the yeah, Northwest yeah, yeah. 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 Remember, that government's voting. still happening. There, yeah. yeah, and so you've got delegates in Philadelphia trying to draft a constitution, but Congress is still taking care of business. In the absence of some of those members, some of those members of Congress are delegates to the convention. Including and they're not, Madison. Yeah, including Madison. so they're not there, but in their absence, um, this Congress decides they're going to prohibit slavery in the, ter in the Northwest Territories. It's all, again, the Northwest Territories being places like what became the states of Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, exactly, Indiana. Exactly, exactly. And shortly after this, almost uh, 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 simultaneous with this, South Carolina says, we must have protections for slavery. Ah, because South Carolina sees that the Northwest Ordinance has prohibited slavery, and maybe there's a movement abroad in the nation growing to attack slavery. They, they, that, they, that's right. And they, they, they sense it. They sense it. It's they in the sense air. It. That's okay. right. It's in the air. So, so what, what does, let's go back then, so then they are on this committee of detail, chairing it in fact, right. and then the, the committee of detail puts forth its recommendations. So what, what comes... What are the, what are the key yeah. um, aspects of that report? Well, uh, in the committee of detail report, you get the first attempt at enumerating powers, which we have in the final constitution, right? Okay. 17 enumerated powers. Those, all 17 of those aren't there. There are, I think, more or less of them. They end up debating those even more. But what you, what you don't find in the Committee of Detail report is a fugitive slave clause. And, hmm. uh, and you also don't find the power of Congress to regulate or prohibit the importation of slaves. That's not there. 
That seems to be, I don't think, right? Well, what, that, that seems to be what South Carolina wants. Well, they don't yeah, want to see those things. Yeah, well, so you're absolutely correct. For the first time, the powers of Congress are listed. Right. See, because uh, the Virginia plan says you can do whatever the states are incompetent. Right. New Jersey plan says you can only do what is expressly listed. So what you have is like a compromise, a long right. list. Right, right. right? Mm -hmm. So now you've listed. The question becomes, what can Congress do? Okay. So now that's where you get a list of things Congress can't do, like habeas corpus is introduced. Right. That's kind of thing. And then you get, and Congress cannot ever abolish ab the importation the, of slaves. Ever or abolish or, the yeah. importation right. clause, ever. Right. So Congress has not been given the power to do that, and in fact, they've been prohibited from doing that explicitly in the Committee of Detail report. That's the influence of South Carolina on the committee. Uh -huh. detail. Okay. Now, what happens? You've got other delegates, as suspected by the South Carolina delegation, who would like to see the importation of slavery ended. And so, interestingly enough, you have uh, Luther Martin of Maryland stands yeah. up and says, he makes a motion that not only would he like to see Congress given a power to tax the importation of slaves, but to end it immediately. Because, he says, he gives a number of reasons why, but the, but the, the, the most important one is the, that this is inconsistent with the principles of the revolution. That's correct. And this is, you talk about, you know, like fireworks going yeah. on. This is where I see people turning red and getting worked up over this motion. And it gets very, the, the, the debates are very, very heated over the next two weeks over this. Because so, now, this because, it used, because the first arguments over slavery were about representation. Just representation. Yes. And they, and they sort of cut a have? deal on that. Right. And then they're uh, on, on the powers of Congress, and they seem to cut something of a deal on that. But now you have the injection in this drama of the moral question. Yep. Is no, slavery under our American principles that's wrong? Correct. But there's no deal yet. Ah. Yeah, see, the, the, because, because South Carolina has essentially thrown the gauntlet down that Congress can never, ever, for the, in the entire history of this world, this nation, ever control the slave trade. And in their minds, the way in order to continue slavery was to continue the slave trade. Now, they may be wrong by our perspective from today that, that the two issues were separate, but they joined them. Right. The, the, so, that, so South Carolina says if we're going to perpetuate the institution of slavery, we have got to be able to continue importing slaves. Yes. So Congress should never be able to ban the importation of slaves. Right. right. Luther Martin from Maryland, from Maryland stands up yeah. and says, no, Congress should be, have the power to ban slavery now. Right now. Yeah. Ban the importation of slaves. Importation now. Of slaves. Now, okay. George Mason, the biggest slaveholder on the, on, on the convention, right. says it is inconsistent with the principles, and it, it, it turns masters into, into, into horrible creatures right. and, and all of that. So even the largest slaveholder from the state of Virginia yes. who's there says, yes. I agree, Congress should have the power to ban the importation of slaves. Okay, so You've got this clash now. Never, yes. uh, never ban it. Ban it immediately. Right. What happens? A, a compromise. You get a committee, a committee. Which is created. <laughs> a committee is created. Okay. okay. Why not? <laughs> uh, why not? To, to sure. work it, work right. it out. All so, right. So Livingston is on that committee, but it's now it's a committee of third of, of all, 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 all the states, states there. All, all, right. all the states that are present. And Madison gets selected from Virginia. All right. And, and so, how does this committee deal with that very dramatic? Issue. It, uh, Madison enters the committee saying that Congress should have the power to prohibit, prohibit the slave trade now. Right now. Right. Yeah. And, uh, a, uh, and a compromise is created on the committee. And that is they may now come back and recommend to the entire convention 1,800. And the justification is if I may use Lincolnian terms, new, new birth of freedom in a new, in a new century, a new start, et cetera, et cetera. We grandfather those in for now, and we work it out to 1800. And Madison is, I think, one of the, he lives with that. He can move from, eight, from now, 1787, to 1800. Because it's better than never. It is better than never, right. and it's right. It's, it's, it's within peaking distance. Okay. Right. And so, Pinckney from South Carolina says, "How about 1808?" And the justification for that is a generation. The next generation. The next generation. Oh, well. uh, I see. 
because right. they think well, generations in that day are 19 to 20 years old. 20 years, okay. that's right, four score. And okay, so one more generation of importation of slaves, and then if then Congress can, if it chooses, ban the importation of slaves. And Madison is livid. The, 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 there is an agreement that is made, on, but it is a very, very close vote, and Virginia votes against it. question is, why does Virginia vote against it? Because it wants 1,800, right. or does it want never? And the answer is because they want 1,800. So Virginia wants to be able to, Congress to ban the importation of slaves sooner. Yes. Uh, but yet we end up with 1808 in the Constitution. That's right, because Roger Sherman says, look, the bigger fish, you know, catches it. We've settled it. 1808, 1800, 1808. What's it? Eight more years, we'll just live with that compromise yes, for and the Madison, sake of reaching an agreement. Exactly. And Madison says in eight years, much mischief can be done. So Madison is uh, again um, disconcerted by not liking this compromise. That, that Does he go correct. along with it? Yes. He doesn't like it, but he swallows it. Yeah, he swallows it. Yeah. I mean, what? Uh, and okay. He, he swallows it. So now, in effect, we we come to an end of Act Three. But again, Madison's on the Virginia delegation, and they vote against it. They vote so against it. He, he voted against it. He voted against okay. it, but, but then but accepted you, the outcome. Yeah. What do you do after that? The the, the once the, they the lost, he didn't voted. want to reopen the issue because the convention had other issues to move on. Well, to. the the uh, yes, that's true, and and the, and also the South Carolina delegation is not pushing <laughs> for protections of slavery. And we again, I don't know. Yeah, no, the future slave clause comes up. No, they, not yet. Not, not until later. Act 4. Not that, until Act right. 4. Because this, is, this gets us to Act 4. Right. Starting, uh, Gordon, as you have it on September 1st, you call Act 4 the end is in sight. That's right. But the fact of the matter is the end might be in sight, but there's still a lot of issues to resolve. What remains in the month of September, in two weeks, what does the convention still have to resolve? The presidency. The presidency. That doesn't mean what we think that today is the most important office in the United right. States has not been settled. It's not been settled. That to me to say it hasn't been introduced. Okay. It's been introduced. It's been introduced. It's been discussed. It's been such and such. And then the, where does it? Where does the discussion stand as of September first, seventeen eighty seven? Uh, it. it it, uh, it stands as what the committee in detail has has, has, has reported, right. and and uh, that, that there's no electoral college. There are a lot of blanks. There's in, a, exactly in the there's a lot of blanks. What what, 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 what did the committee on detail recommend? But, it, for, as far as I can remember, they, they're going along with the idea that the, that, um, that, that 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 the legislative branch would ultimately have. The, uh, the the say and how the president right. became elected. Right. Okay. The were um, they were uh, the the terms in office were short, but, but right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah. I would have to go into the detail to answer the committee in detail. Thing. But the point is, is that they there was still it was still some unsettled business like. Were we really, were we really fulfilling the doctrine of the separation of powers if the Congress had control over electing okay. the president? So what they knew at that point was, as of September 1st, is we're going to have an executive branch. Yes. There's going to be a president. Well. Or there's going to be the number. Some, the number. Of, we don't know the number. Don't number settled, right I don't think okay. that's been settled. Oh, has it? Okay. So yeah, there's been We've gotten down to one. So yeah. we know what yeah. we know yeah. is there's going to be an executive branch, which there hadn't been under the Articles of Confederation. Correct. There's going to be one president at the head of that executive branch, which yeah. was clearly new. You're right. But we did not know a lot of other important things like how are we going to select the president? How, 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 how long will the president serve? And what will all of the president's powers be? How many terms? How many terms? And, how and, long? And can he be removed? And, can the so president the question is the removal and removal? impeachment. Right. Okay, we've got it. I, I count at least five big issues that still are important to Americans today and have been very important throughout the course of our history. They've got 17, they don't know they've got 17 days, but we know, because <laughs> we're watching the drama, they've got 17 days to figure out these five big issues. So a committee is created. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> it's called a Brearley Committee. All right. And, on the, and the major task of this Brearley Committee was to settle, now, now, now okay. The first issue, I think you've, you've got, how do we elect the president? Well, I can't answer that unless or whether I know there's going to be two or one. Well, I can't answer that unless I know how long the president is going to be there. 
I can't answer that unless I know what the powers are. I can't answer that and that's always going to be removed. But I can't answer that unless I know how the president is going to be elected. <laughs> so, went around and around. So, so, so the Brewery Committee had to somehow break that circle. What did they, how did they break it? What did exactly. they get first? The um, Electoral College. Okay. To, and, and, and that follows beautifully yeah. from the kinds of compromises which have been made before. Namely, it is a, a manifestation of the Connecticut Compromise. Okay. Because it involves both the people and the, and the, the states. states. That's right? correct. So they said, look, this is the way we, why don't we set up a system for selecting the president in this, that's similar to the way our legislature is set up? Involving the people, the That's House correct. of Representatives, and the states, the Senate. Let's do the same thing for the presidency. Now, now, now look at that. Now let's carry this one step further because today Americans don't quite understand why this happened. So let's say the Electoral College, in those days, right, if the loser would be the vice president, right? But that, that the second the place, right? Right, right. Yeah. right. But let, let, let's follow the thought. What if the Electoral College was unable? By a system of popular plus um, two votes, because it was each each state that did that compromise. Mm -hmm. What happens if they didn't produce a winner? So and then, in the case of a tie, or some, nobody got a yeah. So they, a, right. A, a, so a so what would happen? Right. Well, the answer what would be go to uh, the house. It, it would, um, yeah, it would go to the house. Right. The election right. would and, go to the house. And, and how many and how many votes would it take? to produce a president? And the answer, in, in, these, in today's terms, uh, I mean, we have 435 representatives, and the natural thought would be 218. Mm -hmm. And when you, you give the inquirer, uh, who was so proud of this answer, you tell them 26. They say, what? It goes to the people's branch, but they vote by states. You're telling me that California has one vote, and Montana has one vote. That's undemocratic. How federal? Right. Ah. So it goes to the House, to, and they vote by state. Well, what about the vice president? If because the vice president, no, 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 it goes to the Senate. Well, we have fifty states. How many votes does it take to elect the? Vice president. So the ink, natural inclination would be 26. The answer is 51. <laughs> and why is that? Because we each state has two. It's 100, and, and uh, uh, half of 100 plus one is 51. That doesn't make any sense at all. But, but it's a nice manifestation of that partly national, partly federal. Partly based on the, the, emerge from the, pe the people's votes convention. and partly based on the r yeah. reality of the states. Yeah, that's great. So we have in the Electoral College this same intention, this same putting together of what you call national and federal or popular and state together for the selection of the president. What about, they settled on the, 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 no, there being one president as yes. opposed to an executive council, which had existed in a number of the states, right, right. in the revolutionary period. Right. Um, why they settle on one president? I think because the argument of the buck stops here. We, yeah. we want responsibility. The, the, the idea of the consequence of due responsibility. Okay. That, and, so that, 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 that if, and if that person didn't behave, you could impeach. Yeah. All right. Yeah, if he's impeachable. So you don't, don't have two All right. yeah. or three. So you, you right. put one, pa one person in charge of the executive branch, give them the executive power. Anti-Federalists did say later, in attacking the Constitution, that's too much like monarchy. And the response of the convention and people like Alexander Hamilton in Federal 70 is, no, no, it's the, quite the opposite, because you can hold them accountable right. for the way they've used the power. And if we have impeachment, we can not only hold them accountable, we can actually remove them from office. That, that is the argument. Right. That, 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 that is correct. And that persuades the convention. That's in September. That, that is correct. And in, the, and, and in that movement, we now have a movement of foreign policy from the Senate in Act Three. The number of, of, of foreign policy 
activities being now moved to the president uh, in Act 4. That seems very important, right? Especially as America has come on the, the world stage and has a more prominent role. The president's powers in military and foreign affairs have grown and grown and grown. The shift happened from Act 3 to Act 4 from in foreign policy from the Senate to the president because, am I, I'm guessing here, because they decided on one president who but, could be so held accountable? The pre well, yeah, but, but the idea that the president then could recommend to the Senate. The Senate said, on the advice and consent, okay. on the such and consent of the Senate. They, so, so they shift the power over, they check it. They shift, but in separation powers and checks and balances. That's exactly correct. Okay, we get to the, the, we get to the close of the fourth act. Uh, what in the last week? Yeah, it's getting down to the wire. Right. What in the? They've been here now for whoa, three and a half months. Yeah, yeah. it's it, been it, hot. It's eighty-eight days. It's hot. Yeah, it, there's a lot it, of argumentation. Right. Some people like each other. Some people definitely don't like each other. Some <laughs> yeah. people are compromisers. Some right. people are not. Some people left and came yeah. back. Some people just left. left. Right. Um, left late. Some left early. Right. <laughs> Hamilton <laughs> left and came back. Hamilton, He's back. He, this is the time that Hamilton comes back. Oh, when we start talking about Act the, Three and Four, executive. the Act executive. Four. He's yeah. now. Now you're talking Alexander Hamilton's language. Yeah. Right. Correct, and he's back. So now to wrap things up in the last week, we create a committee. <laughs> of course we do. <laughs> I call a committee of style. All right. And they have five members on it. And there must be somebody from Virginia, Massachusetts, and from Pennsylvania. Of course. And Connecticut. And Connecticut. And one left over. So now, who's from Virginia? This is, so you can see the mood, the drama, the mood of the convention shifting. Who gets from Virginia? Madison. Ah. Who gets from um, uh, uh, Massachusetts? King. High toned. Mm -hmm. Who gets elected from Pennsylvania? Governor Morris. Governor Morris. Who gets elected from Connecticut? Not Chairman. Livingston, who's just arrived and is going to be the president of Columbia College. So he is a he is a higher tone. A higher tone, what we might call, not surprisingly, for a committee on style, men of style. Literary so style, kind of style thinking, and, and the fifth, yeah, is New York, who isn't, who doesn't even have a quorum, and Hamilton gets selected. Ah, from so he's he the only vote. delegate. He can't here. vote. He can't vote because New York doesn't have a quorum because the other two aren't there. But and yet he gets selected. But he can have a lot of say. We can have a lot of say, which comes back to the point that you have made before, is how do these people get on the committee? And I have suggested the committee is because of the mood of the convention, not because of the internal dynamics of the, because New York can't even nominate anybody. Mm -hmm. Because they can't even, because they don't have a quorum. It's just the convention looks around and says, yes. Hamilton. Hamilton. All Obvious. Right. We so have these five people then. Come and, up with and, a and these are some constitutional heavyweights, James yes. Madison, Alexander Hamilton. These are people who we remember as really constitutional heavyweights. That's right. What does this committee do in the last week? What's his contribution well, what to the end product? Well, what contribution is the preamble? All right. right. They write, Chris, they write the preamble? They write the preamble, and I think Governor Morris is often credited with the, the yeah. final language. The, right, the, the wretch who wrote the pre Constitution. Yeah. The, the wretch who wrote the Constitution. All right. So, <laughs> but, um, uh, so they but write they, the preamble, which has turned out to be very important in American history. Right. What else does the committee on style? Let, 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 let me also say that what is interesting in the movement of writing these preambles is that the number, the, 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 the states aren't mentioned. No. We the people, people of the, the people. United States, oh, yeah. and it doesn't mention the states themselves, right. so that you can, in fact, add states without having to change the Constitution all the time. Really important um, matter of detail, stylistic detail, right. <laughs> yeah. and and but very theoretically, morally, philosophically, politically important. Right, Chris, what else? In that last well, week, does the committee do? It's a lot of organization, right? So things fit into certain parts of the Constitution. Okay. So, so there's some. So there are. It turns out the end the product. There's seven articles. Seven of the articles. There's a lot of clarification of language, but the spirit of what was there before is still there. It's just reworded a lot. But now right. you've got 
uh, seven articles of the Constitution, each with pretty clear, I think, purposes. So okay. Article One, you know, dealing with the with the legislative branch, two, right. the executive, three, the the courts, uh, four, five, interstate. and six, and se four, it, four inter interstate, four interstate relations. Uh, how do you amend? Um, how do, who's uh, boss? Who, 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 yeah, right. Supremacy six, clause. Boss? Supremacy clause. And, and then how six. do you ratify? And, and then seven's ratification is okay. Yeah. Now that we have this, how do we ratify? So it's sort of nice and neatly. So they kind of took like, all of the text that had been written over the course of the summer and argued about, discussed, argued, debated, voted on. They took all that and kind of put it in a coherent order and added a preamble and then cleaned up what they would have understood as cleaned Perfect. up and stylized Perfect. the language. Yeah, I think that's perfect. And it's during this time, September the 10th, after, just right after the communion, that the three members declare that they're not going to sign. Three members who were there from the very beginning, who were in favor of some important changes, Mason, Randolph from Virginia, so now you've set up a real battle in Virginia for ratification. Mm -hmm. Jerry from Massachusetts decides wow. he's not going to change, and he's a sign of the Declaration of Independence, an extremely powerful in Massachusetts. So three people don't sign, and they, they state their objections. And lo and behold, the objection is, is why isn't there a Bill of Rights? Uh-huh. Is, is that a surprise, dramatic moment at the end? Like, yeah. there hadn't been any discussion of this, and all of a sudden, these three three guys well, say, wait a minute, there had, or, been. had there been discussion? There had been a few days where uh, uh, Randolph and Mason had asked, why is there no Bill of Rights? And it's very quickly sort of brushed off the table. We don't need it. I think because we have powers. separation of powers. Yeah. We have We've, Republican government. We have the right, right kind of powers, and we have the right kind of structure. Because Congress hasn't given them, been given the power to violate people's rights, and because the Congress is, is directly elected, the one branch by the people, and so they'll be close to the people, why would they do that? Because there's separation of powers, no branch can be more powerful, it's checked by the others. So the possibility that the federal government could violate rights was seemed very remote. Right. Therefore, right. we don't need it. Right. Right. And, and plus, we already have an you can't pass an ex post facto law. And there's a few it, things it, in there already. It, it, right, right. So that okay. becomes part of the anti federalist later on. Say, why have you put some in and not the others? Yeah. So, so th that had come up on a few occasions, but there was very little debate about it. Um, in the last two days, those things, those objections come back up pretty strongly, and that's when Jerry and um, Randolph and Mason say uh, we are not going to sign because. There's no Bill of Rights, and for some of them, the executive is too powerful. We see the executive becoming more like a monarch. That, that's than, right. And, so than it's, intended, it's, so. and that sets a very important tone for the next dimension. That is, it's not that the Constitution is monarchical or aristocratic, but it has the potentiality. Exactly. And so that issue of potentiality becomes central in the ratification debates. The final drama, I suppose, is the vote. The Committee on Style presents its document to the convention. Now it's got to be voted on. What's the final vote? Um, unanimous. Uh, New York it can't vote, but Hamilton signs. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's unanimous. It's uh, uh, 11 states. That's right. But, yeah, although, so it's although it's, York, Hamilton signs on behalf of New York. But New York can't really vote. <laughs> That's right. So, so, so there's 12. And Rhode Island's not there. And Rhode Island's not there. there. So, right. So you... Right. Right. So I mean, there's 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 no state that objects. <laughs> can, can I? Can I uh, okay. That's right. So, so <laughs> unanimous. <laughs> right. right. Okay. So, so there's this great story though too about um, they they take the vote, and I can't remember who it is. Somebody, a delegate, says, "I'd like to make a change." So they voted on it. They have sent it off to the printers, right? The, the, yeah. the kind of final copies are being printed, and somebody says, "I'd like to change the, something yeah. like the number but, of representatives." But, but, but what happens is George Washington, in order on the on, on the on the Monday, see that they agree. Because George every, Washington is the presiding officer of the convention. That's right, and he he says, uh, "I know everything's been printed, everything's been done, but it's really in, a, in an attempt to to get Randolph's signature." Right. Why don't we shift from one to 40,000 representatives to one to 30,000? 30, because, because Randolph had been very 
uh, was concerned that we weren't really truly a representative. So, so George Washington is trying to change the, what was been agreed to in order to secure Randolph's vote. That's right. And he what thought happens? it was worth it. But uh, he, doesn't. he, he doesn't, doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. The he convention says, it. look, we voted. We're done. No, actually, they do go up one to 30,000. They go with Washington, and Randolph still doesn't sign. Yeah. Ah. They agree to the change. They agree to but Washington's change. it's not enough change. for Randolph. No. no. So the final drama, the final last part of the drama is this vote. It happens unanimously, or without objection at least, 11 states officially approve the, the document. Right. Gordon, the famous story at the end of the convention, <laughs> which has been held behind closed doors in Philadelphia. Yeah. No one in the general public knows what's going on. People are, the delegates are understood to be in secret and supposed to keep these deliberations secret. You sound like a progressive historian saying they all raised a plot against we the people. No, just that they wanted to have honest, open deliberations. That's exactly, right? there you go. Thank you for that That's good why. line. That's why. No, I, I, I don't mean to suggest otherwise. You no, know, I was teasing but, you. <laughs> but at the end of the convention, yeah. there is this story of Benjamin Franklin emerging from Independence Hall in Philadelphia. That's right. And th th so there are th three parts. The first part is Franklin, uh, uh, on the last day, saying to people, you know, you, perfection is not possible. We actually have created a more perfect union. Hmm. Madison now has a certain uh, 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 approach that he can take in the Federalist, is that the measure of, of this is not whether it's perfect, but it is more perfect than the articles. So Franklin's part one is we have a more perfect. Don't go for perfection. And so that's a very important question in today's life. Can we live with imperfection? Mm -hmm. Okay. Point number two is he he says at the end, as he said, he says it's the rising sun. He sees the, the chair, and the, Washington has the, the sun on the back of Washington's chair, and he's been seeing it all these days. So he's been reflecting. Am I seeing a rising sun? Uh, what, the, what we've been working on and, and the website, that sort of hope, the idea of uh, the rising sun measuring the notion of hope, or am I seeing a setting sun that we're leaving here <laughs> is the sun rising on America or setting? That's right. And he says, I see it rising. Uh -huh. Now, that is the message that he leaves. And as he leaves, um, one of the prominent uh, ladies in town comes up to him and says, in fact, so, Mr. Franklin, what have we created? And he says, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Hmm. And so the question then becomes, how do you keep it? Well, first of all, you have to ratify it. And then, how do you keep it? And that, I think, becomes our task. Our task. And one of the ways that you both have been contributing to that task is to work together on this, um, the AmericanFounding.org website, which is devoted to telling the story of the American founding, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitutional Convention, the Constitutional Ratification, and the Bill of Rights. It's gonna, it is a truly wonderful website. I want to thank you both for your work on that. Gordon, you once said, in mm -hmm. connection to that project, and, and let me quote you, mm. <laughs> it's hard to love an ugly founding. Was America ill-founded, well-founded, or even incompletely founded? Each of these judgments captures some essential part of the American story. Choose a date when the founding started, and you'll probably get a different date for America. 1492, 1619, 1620, 1776, 1787, or even 17, or even 1863. All right, looking back now on this Constitutional Convention and on your and Chris's work on this American founding website, how do you both look, view the founding? Was it ill-founded? Was it well-founded? Or was it incompletely founded? Go ahead. I, 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 insofar as human beings can do good work, I think it was well founded. But that doesn't mean to say that it was perfect, as Gordon was just saying. And that's why I like uh, the, the notions of Franklin at the end are extraordinarily appropriate for how I, th I think we ought to, to think about the Constitution. Um, framing is difficult. and. Um, it's done by imperfect human beings, and it's done by 
in, in the case of the convention by a number of people with different goals and, 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 and visions and ideas of how things ought to be done. Um, it's, it is the, um, the best work of human hands that probably could have been con, um, created given all of the difficulties and challenges that they were facing. Mm. It's not, it's, it's imperfect, but again, what, what's perfect? But it, but it, it is also well-founded in the sense that it, it, it allows for it to be improved upon and perfected as we move forward. And that's why that message of hope from Franklin, I think, is, is how I view the, the, the Constitution. Gordon, right. the founding, okay. ill-founded, right. well-founded, okay. or incomplete. Uh, to answer that question, I'm going to pose, I'm going to pose, I've thought through that. Uh, the, per, the, the perfect founding for me has been presented as in Plato's Republic. Hmm. And that there is no faction, that those who rule should rule, that those who should work for a living work for a living. <laughs> uh, everything has worked out fine and it is blessed by all sorts of magic. And, um, and it's perfect. What is lacking? Freedom. What is lacking? Consent. What is lacking? Deliberation. Um, and what happens to this perfect regime? It collapses the immediate, immediately Socrates leaves the scene. And what does it collapse into? Other regimes which are involved. So in a sense, if the, oh, if the, if the perfect regime, like we, let's forget about um, uh, beyond this earth. Let's talk about what human beings. Could. If the if the best, if the perfect regime is Plato's Republic, and it requires Socrates to make it work, then, in a certain sense, the perfect regime is ill-founded. And I put that my sort of image when I think about the creation of the American Republic. You're talking about people being elected, people being consented. The, behind closed doors is that so they could talk honestly with each other. They go through the deliberations. They have to accept outcomes. And I think it's well-founded in the sense that can you accept the outcome? Now, there's the shaking of hands between Melanchthon Smith and Alexander Hamilton and the New York Ratifying Convention, after both have gone like that at each other, signifies the hope and the message of well-founded in the sense of, you know, as the same baseball, wait till next year. In America, it's wait two years. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. So in that regard, not only can the Constitution be amended, but we have biannual congressional elections, and I wish we would change our attitude from presidential elections to congressional elections, again, instead of calling it the midterm mm -hmm. or the off year, we call it the real elections, right? right? And it happens every two years, come rain, come shine. We can't postpone it because of war or, 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 or disease or plague. It's there. That's a guarantee. That's well-founded. That is well-founded that we can reconsider because we are relying on the consent of the governed. And if you rely on the consent of the governed, then you're not relying on Plato. Well, that's tremendous. Thank you so much for introducing us to this amazing drama, the Constitutional Convention. You really brought it alive for us today in this conversation. Uh, insights into it, the personalities, the human beings, the imperfect human beings who helped to create it and who bestowed on us, as the founders call it, this experiment in self-government that really is up to us as Americans to perpetuate. Thank you for your work in, with Ashbrook in helping us to perpetuate America's experiment in self-government. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank pleasure. you very much, pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The American Idea, a production of the Ashbrook Center. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a five-star rating and review on your platform of choice. Subscribe for more at ashbrook.org slash American Idea Pod, and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at AM Idea Podcast. From the SRAM Library in Ashland, Ohio, I'm Jeff Sickenga. <laughs>